Hey friends, this is Carter and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I get to sit down with other writers and just talk about life, the industry, roots of creativity, things we're pissed off about, whatever, whatever comes to our mind. Um, and because it's a very um, unscripted uh, conversation, um, we never know which way it's going to go, which is why the making it up part at the end is always so much fun because that, that kind of personifies the, the conversation as a whole. We have no idea what's going to happen. And um, it's entertaining to me, whether it's entertaining to you or not. I don't know. I hope it is. Uh, before we get to today's guest, just a reminder that if you hop on over to unboundwriter.com, my writing company, you can check out any uh, uh, in-person retreats we might be offering for 2025. We haven't set any up yet, but they will be there, um, along with one-on-one -on -one coaching that I do and our self-guided online courses, of which there are currently three now being offered at unboundwriter.com. All right. So for today, today I had the pleasure of talking to my friend friend Edward Hamlin. So Edward lives in Boulder. So, you know, probably 15 miles from me. And um, I, I go, I, I explain at length how we got to know one another um, in the episode itself, but it was through us both winning the Colorado Book Award and doing um, a couple events together. I got to know him a little bit and we've been able to um, get together for a few meals every now and then and talk very much like the conversation we just had, which was, uh, you know, I even mentioned at the end, normally when I sit down and talk to a writer on the show, even though I don't have any questions prepared, there's usually a linear trajectory to it. I usually talk about about their past um, childhood influences, you know, when did they study in college? How, you know, when did they start writing their first book? Whatever it is, it's usually that kind of progression. Once in a while, and in the case with Edward, we just launch and start talking about whatever. Uh, in this case, we, we started talking to Amelia about social media <laughs> and the responsibilities of a writer to stay on top of that now versus, say, eight or 10 years ago. And, you know, we just kind of had this very organic conversation, mostly about um, a lot about the industry, for sure, um, about his book. Um, so his debut book, I should absolutely 100 percent mention, actually launched on the same day as mine in April. It's called Sonata in Wax, and it's... Um, it's it, it's a wonderful book and and just to give you a little bit of background about edward um he's been uh, published widely and recognized with a number of awards including the nelson algren award and the iowa short fiction award um the, what he won the colorado um book award for was a collection of short stories and sonata in wax is his first published novel as he will say in the episode he has a few that um he wrote that never that never found a home um so um you know we could kind of compare notes i mean and we also talked about genres or lack thereof um if you wanted to kind of uh draw a line between myself and edward um his he would be on the side of literary fiction where i would be on the side of genre fiction um subset thriller suspense mystery um but how you define that line is a very personal choice and there are no rules or no real great rules around all of that um so we talked about that as well and at the end um he i will say he is edward is um really good <laughs> at making it up uh so when we got to the storytelling bit at the end it f his side just flowed out of him um as he was reading a finished product where I'm like, what the fuck am I going to say? <laughs> so it was good. It was good. He was he 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 was great, and I think he kind of lifted the story uh, between the two of us. So uh, this was a great one. It was good catching up with my buddy. This is my conversation. This conversation. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, congrats on the Kirkus review. They are, uh, as one person told me once, they are notoriously stingy with yeah. their praise. Uh, yeah. So that's awesome. You must be very excited. I am, yeah. And my agent's word for uh, that was snarky. I think they they have that reputation too. So that yeah. was, uh, you know, pleasingly free of snark as far as I could read. <laughs> uh, and But a little bit, a little bit late, right? Like, uh, like it's, and, and I've heard a few things, you know, about 
trades lately and how it's getting more and more difficult to even get reviewed. I mean, I think my last book was the first time in like six or seven books. Like I didn't get anything from Publishers Weekly. I didn't get anything from Library Journal. Yeah. And I asked my publisher and they're just like, yeah, they just, they're so overwhelmed. And that would almost speak to a review from Kirkus for your book that came out in April coming out now. Yeah. I mean, I've heard a couple different factors behind it. One is there's just a whole lot more books being published, right? Yeah. And the second is most of the old traditional media outlets that had book reviewers don't have book reviewers anymore. Totally. You know, just a few, if you're thinking about Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, and so on. There are, And it's almost impossible to get review. I mean, the, the stacks right. that they have to go through. Yeah. And we had um, a really top-notch publicist um, who did all the stuff she should have done and has personal relationships with all those people. And um, there was some, what looked like early interest from the Washington Post, but of course it all happens behind a curtain. You don't get to know. Um, but they were, um, they were interested. They would requested more arcs, uh, but hmm. you know, who knows, maybe next year they'll get around to reviewing it. But yeah, yeah I, it's really, really hard. And I, I've been advised by my editor and my agent and everybody else just not to be discouraged because it, I mean, I, like you, I, my first book was 2015. I had um, Publishers Weekly, Forward Reviews, various others without even trying, you know, yeah. You yeah. to go after it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's funny. I, I, I don't know how much the reputation even matters. And I'm not talking about the author's reputation, although I think once you're a big name, that's definitely a part of it. But the, the the publicist relationship with those reviewers. I mean, what I get is I get, you know, monthly reports and, you know, when it comes to something like that, it'll say, yep, I can confirm that they've received the copy that they asked right. for it and they received it. <laughs> right. Who knows what the secret sauce is after that. And you can only envision this. And I met, I met the woman who at least at the time reviewed for USA today and I was just fascinated by her because I'm like, what is what is your world like? And she's, you know, she's a book a day person mm -hmm. and which is crazy to me like that. But she loves it. But and even at that pace, you know, that's whatever, how many books that is in a year, probably maybe 200. She can't be reviewing all of them all the time, but um, out of tens of thousands of potential books. So it's like. Yeah. How do you, I mean, they must not even, it must be, get, gets to the point where their methodology is not even a methodology. It's just like, I guess I like that cover. They're just like the schmucks like the rest of us. <laughs> right. right. Oh, that one fell off the top of the pile. That's right, the, right. Yeah. That must be a sign from the universe that I should read it. Right, right. Um, no, it, it's, it's discouraging. And I, at the same time, I've also been told reviews don't sell books like you think they should. No. Uh, because now, of course everything's viral and it's more like it's made me focus and appreciate even more on independent booksellers who yeah. do sell books and yeah. you can get the viral thing going online, but you can also get the viral thing going with a bookseller who falls in love with your book and recommends it to everybody. And I mean, I had, I just did this event in Boston last week and one of my favorite uh, photographs that came out of it was a woman coming up to the signing table with four copies of my book. Hmm. You know? So, and it's not even quite the holidays. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, almost. <laughs> but that kind of thing where somebody reads it, that person had already read the book. They loved it. They came there to meet me to get four copies signed for yeah. friends and family. And that, I mean, you know, little by little. Yeah, works. it is, you know, after having done this for a number of years and, and being kind of a data oriented person, you do kind of latch on to like what works, what doesn't work. And you kind of realize over time, I think all that PR, all the stuff that you, your publisher does, and maybe that you hire yourself, like in my case, I always do that as well. Yeah. I think that gets you maybe into the conversation. I think without that, if you're a self-pubbed author, it's yeah. really tough, man, um, because you just don't have, but, <clears throat> but getting into the conversation is the bare minimum of any kind of success. And you do realize that it is very, 
at the end of the day, it's very word of mouth. It's very like mm -hmm. something about this book is just, it's weird. Like the book that I have coming out in January, I, I love to track the early Goodreads reviews, not so much the content, although sure, you know, you want to have good reviews, but just the quantity, mm -hmm. like who's, you know, who's getting this off NetGalley, who's looking. Where's the buzz? Where's the buzz? And and for the book coming out in January, I already have twice the number of reviews almost that my last book had in the when it came out. And this is still three and a half months away. So I'm like, all right, there's something yeah. that we didn't do that is a little bit more organic about this book. And I don't know what it is. And, and you realize like there's only so much you can control, um, yeah. but you do need to do enough to get you into the game. And you realize like a lot of what the PR people do is they're they are identifying those those um, uh, Instagrammers, especially on Instagram, who have the greatest and who have 50,000 followers and all they do are book reviews. Like, yeah, let's yeah. target this person, which yeah. is smart. But yeah. how do you do that on your own? It's, it's Yeah, no, I had, I had one of those actually came through my publisher, not through the publicist, but um, uh, somebody, I, I forget how I figured this out, but some Instagram book reviewer published a pic picture of her poodle next to my dog. I mean, next to my book, <laughs> not next to my dog, next to my book. And I'm like, who is, the I didn't know who they were. They're not right. my friends of mine. I didn't even recognize the dog. And I remember people's dogs pretty well. Uh, and then I figured out, oh yeah, she's an online book reviewer and her dog loved my book. <laughs> and uh, she had thousands of followers. So yeah. that's, yeah. Great. Um, totally. I think, totally. I think the publisher sent her an arc um, unbeknownst to me. Yeah. That, you know, paid off. At least with yeah. the dog, you know, the dog readership, I'm sure. Right, were. right, right. Yeah. Well, Instagram is very friendly for, for book reviewers and that kind of, it's a very safe space, I feel like. But yeah, you just don't know what's going to work and you, and you have to let people kind of do their jobs and then the other key thing is it's like you have to not overdo it and because you you and i have both seen friends colleagues other writers who have a book coming out and it's just like incessant like yeah. every you know and and sure when you have something coming out you are ramping up your online presence and you're posting about it so i get that but when it's just like every day there's a post from somebody about their book and maybe the book came out three years ago but it's just like after a while you're like you're you're turning people off at this point. yeah flogging um, it too hard no, and, and how do you find that balance i mean what has your been your experience with that well, I don't know if I got the balance right. You know, <laughs> you never my know. First was, my first book was eight years ago, right? So it was a different world. I didn't do any internet promotion other than maybe some Facebook posts to my friends, you know. Right, right. And this time around, I really bit the bullet and realized I had to. And so I didn't even have an Instagram account. So I got one of those. I had a Twitter account, but now I don't want to be swimming in that cesspool. Right. Um, and you know, I have Facebook and stuff. So I I did it, you know, <clears throat> I did it in the run up to the publication date about once a week. I did an Instagram post, mirrored it on Facebook, mirrored it on Twitter. And an approach that I took that was just kind of fun for me was to say, let's pull out some mysteries from the book. Hmm. Like let's talk about some characters from the book. And each post would kind of have a photograph of that character, if it was a real person, because there are real historical characters in the book, right. or a sort of distorted or fuzzy or unclear picture of someone like a, a virtuoso pianist, concert pianist. Really, it was a picture of Horowitz, but I blurred it so much mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily know that. And um, raised sort of a mystery question in the post, like, what piece did so and so perform in Chicago at the oh, it's like Jeopardy Center <laughs> Theater? Um, <laughs> and I mean, so I did. I, you know, I had some fun with it. Maybe it was fun for people. Maybe they just yeah. you know turned away. I have no idea. Yeah, you just don't know. And it's the whole online thing. And and maybe we're getting too much of a tangent here, but it's been in my mind 
lately because so recently I just did two events at the Tattered Cover Colfax. So for listeners, yeah, you know, big big an indie bookstore in Denver has been around since 1971, and they have a big space downstairs where they do events. And in each one of these events, I was I was interviewing somebody. So it was their event, and I, they were in conversation with me. The first one was of my doing, and it was the lead singer of the band James, who sold 25 million albums. And their UK band been around for 40 years, touring in the States for the first time in seven years. And I've gotten to know the lead singer. So he has a book that just came out, uh, his first novel. So big name, like, you know, I'm a little star starstruck by him. 40 people showed up and I, you know, which was fine and healthy and good, um, you know, ticketed event. <laughs> Two weeks later, I was asked to interview this guy, Kyle Prue. Very cool guy. I didn't know who he was. And he wrote a small humor book um, that was based on his TikTok account, right? So same publisher as mine. So um, again, very engaging guy. I barely did any promotion for it. You know, sold out. I've never gone to a tattered cover event. That was they stopped selling tickets. It was about 140 people. Wow. And he was truly like a celebrity to these people who have just followed him online, but he had never, he had never really written a book before. And it was just, you know, a one line per page kind of a humor book. Um, and, and I was just talking to my partner and I'm like, it's just wild. It's just like, it's, you know, this lead singer who has millions of fans, we get 40, 40 people. Yeah. 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 No, <laughs> and my, you just, you know, yeah, it's unpredictable. My wake up call for that, which was great. Um, uh, you, I mean, being in the genre you're in, you probably know Jane Harper. She oh, sure. Line. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah. blurbed you, right? Yeah. She blurbed me. And the reason, the only reason I know her, we did a, um, an online three month novel writing class as one of about 10 people years and years and years ago, it was run by a UK literary agency and it was fun. And there were people from all over the world. Um, I made a lot of friends, including Jane, who is a delightful, lovely person. And <clears throat> we workshopped uh, what was then a 60 page, pretty rough word manuscript for a book she was working on that soon thereafter became The Dry, which was her breakthrough yeah. international bestseller, made a movie with her. I well. lost to that book uh, for an award. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, yeah. Um, I, I don't want to come between my two friends. It's okay. <laughs> I, I highly yeah. respect Jane. But anyhow, um, I kept in touch with her. And I mean, her story is an amazing story anyway, but, you know, she had never published a book. The book was unfinished. Right after the class, she entered it in a competition run by the govern government of New South Wales. She lives in Australia. Mm -hmm finished novels she won and so she had to really quick scramble to finish it patient <laughs> within a couple of weeks once she had representation she had a three book deal with Macmillan in Australia and a parallel three book deal with Flatiron in New York who's part of Macmillan right. uh, just off to the races you know so anyway some years after the dry came out she was on her first North American tour. She was being sent around by Flatiron. And uh, I had frequent flyer miles. So I'm like, I'm going to go meet her because I never met her in person. We right. typed a couple times. And so I flew to um, wherever it is you fly to and you know, got to Lawrence, Kansas, because that's where mm -hmm. she was going to be. And um, attended a book event of hers. And I... I mean, I write literary fiction. I go to my friend shit and it's literary fiction mostly. Although I went to one of yours. But <laughs> I mean, you know, literary fiction does not draw this kind of crowd generally. I mean, unless yeah. it's a you know, top drawer name. It was in some community facility, some community center, and there were 300 people, 400 people, something That's amazing. like that. I mean, they didn't have enough books by a long shot. The local bookstore simply didn't have enough books. And the signing line was around, you know, around the room. I, I you know, I, I mean, it sounds naive, but it was an eye opener to me. It's like, yeah, it is. Right I mean, well, 
to be fair, that's that is a rarefied event where I mean, because you, you, I know several New York Times bestselling authors who are like, yeah, ten people were there. It it, it just depends, um, and it's also like just the buzz of that book in the moment and. And this is something we've talked about before, and I thought it would be worthy to talk about in the podcast because you've kind of brought it up, the, you know, kind of the difference between literary and genre, you know, however watery and ill-defined or probably undefined that that may be. Um, you can have a book that is masterfully written, wonderfully reviewed, and poorly sold. Um, if If in the literary side of things, <laughs> conversely, you could have a shit genre book that, and I'm not suggesting that's James at all. Cause I know the dry is an amazing book, but like, it's just what people read more um, by and large. Uh, and, and so, and that's, that's frustrating. And, that, and you can also have a shit genre book like me and still no one shows up. So it, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it just, it's weird, you know, to be like, well, what's, and then it makes you start thinking like, okay, what's the formula and you, and once you tell yourself there is no formula, you're much better off because it's yeah. it's maddening to try to break break it down. Yeah. Well, our mutual friend Eric Krauss said wisely, "It's not about sales; it's about readers." True. Good advice. Yeah, it is. It is, but it's. I think my I, I believe my thinking over it has changed over time. I, mm -hmm. I you know, I, I think originally and for quite some time, and especially when I had a full time job that mm -hmm. let me have a little bit more hubris about my writing. To me, it was just like, just get the word out. Like, uh, you know, I don't care if you share the book, <laughs> I don't, you know, whatever, like just, you know, if, try to get that buzz. And then it gets to a point in time for me, at least, where I'm like, you know, I, I want sales because I want to support myself more fully writing. But when you try to figure out how to do that, it's to me, it becomes not so much a matter of changing what you're doing, but maybe increasing your output if you can, um, or at least being consistent with your output. Um, because once I have a book out there, I know it's going to be there <laughs> and people can buy the backlist once it's a backlist item. And hopefully it all becomes additive at some point well i'm i'm on a consistent eight-year cycle i'm like <laughs> yeah I'm like well, a well, speaker, you know? <laughs> so but let's talk about that too because so and again for the listeners you know edward and i i i think we first met because we were both um we both won the colorado book award years yeah. and years years ago and you were short fiction mm -hmm. and we did a reading at the Boulder bookstore. And I think I've told you this story, but again, for the listeners, I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of readings. Most people do not read well, and most people right. read too long <laughs> and most people don't read well and read too long. So, um, because most exactly. authors just don't know how to be in front of people. And that's <laughs> not a disparaging remark. It's just true. I think. True. <laughs> <to be> <laughs> yeah. And so you can read something that's amazing and it'll sound like shit. Uh, or vice versa, maybe, depending on what a, kind of an actor you are. But I remember at that night, you were the only person who stood up and read that I followed. I'm like, this is a really interesting story. And you were doing a really good job. You were, you were, you were giving your work the respect it deserved. You, you clearly, I'm guessing, had rehearsed it. Um, but it just it felt very... It, it felt very easy to listen to it, and then therefore I can follow. Because um, I'm kind of dim-witted, so if somebody starts reading I, in like seconds, I'm like tuning out. Um, and I, I just remember you were reading, I'm like, that's a really compelling story. Um, so I think that's kind of how we first got to know each other a little bit, and we obviously live very close to one another, so we've gotten to know each other a little bit over time. But you've kind of dabbled in different styles of writing and, and and sonata and wax your recent release in april was you was your first true novel like well the first one that saw the light of day yeah right right <laughs> yeah. right 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 let's clarify I that yeah i think it's the fifth one that i've written and my agent still has two in her bag and i'm i'm actually talking to an editor right now about one of those um so i have two more that I think are, you know, that I would be proud to publish. 
and some corpses you're like you know you, i'm talking to you so i'm thinking about corpses in the corner I don't... <laughs> <laughs> I, I i've got book corpses aplenty yeah no no you're you're kind of a corpse specialist that's <laughs> <laughs> but put that uh, on my business card exactly i have others but i have three that i consider really you know done done one of which is in print um, but yeah it's my debut novel as far as a publication goes yeah and and when you were thinking about and obviously music informs a lot of your um, background and history and 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 um other uh, recreational hobbies i know you're a very uh, well accomplished guitarist um but i know you wanted to set out to write you know a novel about music did you ever like as as you're and, and maybe not even just this novel but all of your novels published or, or not do you think about the market do you think about like oh where is this going to land or is it just like this is so interesting to me this is the story i want to tell so i think i think about it more in the the fear factor terms of <laughs> you know, is there a market for this and what are mm -hmm. the what are the limiters in this story so like in Sonata and Wax, the, it's, not a, it's not a novel about music per se. I mean, you'd have to right. to a degree it is, but I think of it as more of a novel about a lie and the kind of moral consequences that play out from that. And right, it's, con it's conflict, but it's, it's conflict. got music as a character. Right, well, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, music is sort of the framing thing and a, and a character. The Sonata is certainly a character in the story. Um, but... So there's the fundamental marketing question of how many people are going to be turned off by uh, a novel with Sonata in the title. And uh, <laughs> classical music is um, the, the thread running through it. Those are, there, there's a little jazz in it too, by the way. Oh, okay. But, um, and then conversely, you know, I, I'm just guessing, I haven't done my market research, but I'm guessing that the demographic who listens to, you know, Colorado Public Radio classical station overlaps heavily with the literary fiction reading demographic. Yes. And so from that perspective, there aren't actually very many novels about classical music. There are some, but it's not a very well-tilled field. Right. And it's, no, I keep being told, it's notoriously hard to write about music, the experience of uh, listening to music. And so maybe that's why, but is that because it's such a personal thing? Um, yeah, I think it's also because it's such a nonverbal thing. Yeah. You know, music is talking to another part of our brain than language is. And I, I, I mean, it's, and I think English at least has a is sort of, it has a little bit of poverty when it comes to good descriptive words about musical experience. Maybe mm. French is better, I don't know. But, um, you know, if you're trying to describe sort of what uh, a, a powerful piece of music, whether it be like, you know, I've been listening to like Mahler. <laughs> yeah, Mahler. I mean, I was like, what came in my mind it was just silly but true was I've been listening to a lot of goose jams lately, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, like great jam band. So when you get to that kind of like incredible meshing of a really good band, or maybe the really good band is the Chicago Symphony Orchestra performing Beethoven, who knows? In any case, a lot of our terminology conventionally to describe that experience is erotic or uh, gustatory, you know, f f um, mm -hmm. tastes, smells, I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's like there's not really much of an independent lexicon to describe music. Right. Uh, and because, and even if there were, how I would describe a piece would be different than how you would describe a piece, which totally. is, 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 you know, take something else, take something tangible, <laughs> and we would probably describe it with some kind of Venn diagram overlap. Mm -hmm. um, but music, it could be like, whatever you describe could be something I hate and <laughs> you I, know, the piece I, itself. So it's, it's just so personal. I, well, um, I, I think too, that, you know, music is like any art. Uh, 
music can bring moments of transcendence, meaning you're taken out of yourself. You're not thinking about your ego. You're not worrying about what's on your calendar for tomorrow. For some amazing moment, you're liberated from all that. You yeah. float above all that. And, you know, that can happen with a work of art. It can happen with music. It can happen with literature. I've had those moments reading books. Um, totally. It can happen with sex. It can happen with right. distance marathon running, I hear. Right, I, right. It's a moment of self-actualization when that happens. And you're, yeah. you are truly out of body and and you know you're curious about what's happening but you're also just lost in the moment yeah and i think everybody's experience of that is very personal i mean to come back to your thought about that it's very personal it's very unique in some ways ineffable you know maybe it's not something you should try to describe in words right and so that gets to kind of how do you describe those moments in the medium of words which is the medium we work in but right. also you're more you're not naming it, you're pointing toward it. Right. Maybe you do that through metaphor. I was about to say metaphor plays a big role to describe, like as you just enumerated, other experiences that might make it relatable. Right. Uh, right. But how do you, so you kind of described your book as a lie and what people, the extent people would go to to protect that lie. So that's, so for example, that could easily be any type of book or certainly a thriller, mystery, suspense, um, quote unquote genre book. And you have, you, and, and you have this deep love of music, which is woven as a tapestry throughout the book and serves as its background for sure. How do you know, how do you know when you're overdoing it? Like, do you wait for an editor to tell you that? Because it's a trap we all fall into. It's like, I can't wait to talk about this thing that I love. <laughs> and yeah. and that thing that I love might not be the core or might not even be additive in that moment to what the, the, the core of the book. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of a sudden you're pulling the reader out or you could potentially do that. Um, mm -hmm. Conversely, if you don't do it enough, you're not giving that deep, rich experience that you were hoping to give to the reader. How bouncing do you figure them, out that balance? Bouncing them off instead of pulling them in. Totally. Yeah, that's, a, that's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, I think it is. <laughs> that's, that's where you come back. I come back to the idea of, you know, writing is a discovery process. So if you go into it and you know exactly what your destination is, it's probably going to be boring for you and the reader. Right? right. Right. If you go into it and you have, say, a final scene, murky in your mind, you have some kind of faintly visible destination, maybe, and you go and you go into it um, with the commitment that that destination might change en route. Yeah. You may not that you may go somewhere more interesting than where you thought you were going when you started. So I think if you go into it with that sort of um, beginner's mind openness to uh, wrong turns, open openness to country roads that lead off the main plot line that you thought you were taking. Yes. Um, I think that helps a little bit because then you're sort of discovering with the reader the experience yeah captured yeah um, yeah yeah I, I i don't think you could have described it better and you know it's easy for me to say because i don't outline and i think if if it's in your nature to outline and that's how your brain works you're probably going to get your best version of that work by doing what works for you um but what you just said completely speaks to me because I don't know where it's going. And I think what you have to have is you have to have such a trust. Not You have to have a confidence in yourself as a writer, which <laughs> is a very easy thing to say and an incredibly difficult thing to have. And that takes years of, 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 of being decent enough at it where you're like, all right, it's going to suck at first, but I'll figure it out. Yeah. But it also takes a deep trust in your subconscious to know I've read my whole life. I've watched shows my whole life. I know what works for me. I know what gets me emotionally um, excited. And I don't have a plan, but all that information stored. <laughs> yeah. And as I physically write, as words appear on my screen, that shit starts to leak out. And it's really weird because 
I will suddenly write something, and this all happens almost, almost every time I sit down to write, um, that something changes, and I'm like, there's no way I would have been able to outline this specific twist or this specific. Uh, left pain only. Yeah, it's so it's so weird, and you and you like to think that because of that, it's a better story. It's at least a more surprising story because right. it's it hadn't occurred to you. But right. but you're right; you do make some wrong turns doing that, and that could be a five thousand word wrong turn. Right. And you're just like, all right. But I think it's so important to just get it out there and just finish that first draft and then become a little bit more analytical and mechanical in the editing with more of a market mindset. Um, and the other side of all of that is like when you're not knowing what's going to happen and you go through that act of discovery, to me, that's the joy of writing. That's mm -hmm. where it's exciting. I'm looking forward to like, what happens today? I don't know. And yeah. that's, that, that's what gets me to the, to the computer to write. If it was just like, I knew everything, I just had to write it all down that kind of feels like homework. <laughs> yeah, that's like taking dictation, you know. Right. And, and, okay. and, and sometimes I wish I could do that because it would be so much faster. <laughs> At least for certain passages. I mean, I can, I feel like I can always detect that in other writers' work. Yeah, you know, right. When they're just like overly outlined or my other pet peeve, overly researched. Yes, research. and over research is fine, but how much are you going to show that? I mean, how many, how often have we read three pages on something that you could do like, Oh, he just could not wait to share this. Like, and exactly. like this, this doesn't propel the story at all. It's right. just a distraction. It's an interesting distraction, but it's a distraction. Right. Um, that happens I, all the time. You know, even some very well-known writers do that writers whose work I respect in other ways, um, fall into that trap. I'm not going to name any names, but I am thinking of one <laughs> particular yeah. book. Um, but uh, that's a trap too. And I mean, I, I've like st stuck in my mind all these years. There's one story in my short story collection, the release that has a, I think, really cool ending uh, to me anyway. And I didn't see it coming until I literally wrote it. Um, there's a, a scene where a young mentally disabled uh, girl is scattering her father's ashes over a bluff in Bodega Bay in California. Mm. And I mean, I didn't know that was coming. I didn't see that, but somehow everything led to it, you know? Yeah. And, right. And so that's your it, subconscious working. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, well, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I mean, somehow the story, the narrative led to that. And then, you know, the subconscious maybe was the one that put it together and said, okay, here's the image now. Now, right. now here's what I'm seeing. And then once you see that, it's easy to write. But, totally. But that story, that uh, in my collection, that story is the one that is the clearest example in my own writing experience of uh, an ending that I think is a great ending, one of the better ones I've ever written and came did not come out of this side of the head at all. It's not a yeah. adventure whatsoever. And, and the moment that happens, that day that you're actually writing the ending, it is, is kind of going back to talking about music. It's that kind of transcendental experience of just like, wow, that's oh, yeah. like, oh, and, yeah. and you know, you're trying to push your ego down a little bit. You're like, maybe people are going to hate this, but this is making me emotional writing this or like, it'll happen. Like it happened with my last book, like 70% in. I'm like, oh, all these characters have a fear of abandonment. I knew mm -hmm. my main character did that way, but then I start to realize like, oh, everybody else does as well. I didn't realize that until I just started writing this. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. <laughs> like, I don't know if that's important or not, but I didn't realize that. Um, but somehow the back of your mind is just like letting that stuff, if you allow it to, if you don't get it in your own way, right? And so then when you see those connections do you then look in the mirror and say "Ooh, do i have a fear of abandonment too no. <laughs> that well from? that's 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 a whole other conversation of you know because they because that's what people want to know right yeah. they want to know how much <laughs> and we don't want to tell <laughs> i know and i got so sick of hearing from people who i know saying oh man i totally see you in here <laughs> yeah. and that so starting with my third published book i switched to writing mostly from a female pov 
mm-hmm. specifically to, and then I realized like that was a very freeing experience because I realized like it's, it's when you try to not sound like you, it opens up a whole world of possibilities of what you can sound like. Yeah. Um, and, and it's very freeing, but that's everyone. My mom, I had, <laughs> this is a terrible story, but let my, I had a book, I finished it and then it was my fourth book and I couldn't quite figure out why my main character, who was only 19, made some decisions along the way. So I realized like I needed to understand his his past. And so I ended up like creating kind of this universe for him where he had been molested by a teacher when he was very young. And it it did kind of explain a lot of different things. And then my mom <laughs> My mom like waited for like a month and then we were driving somewhere and she pulls over. She's like, I have to ask you something. Which teacher? (laughs) Yeah, basically she had been talking to my sister. She's like, do you remember like, and cause she's like writers write what they know. I'm like, Jesus, my first book, like I had a guy literally crucifying people. I've never done that to anyone. Like (laughs) give us credit for some imagination, but I also felt horrible, but, but you can't get away from the fact that most readers are going to say like, oh, there's, I wonder what part of this is you, Like, I'm sure you get some of those questions. For sure. For sure. And, you know, my latest answer, I mean, in my, in Sonata and Wax, you know, I have a, a female um, protagonist point of view character in the historical timeline, World War One, and I have a male protagonist point of view character in the contemporary timeline, 2018. And so I kind of got both, you know, opportunities. And I've written a lot of women um, POV characters. I think the majority of them in my story collection are actually women. Mm-hmm. Characters. But uh, I've I do have certain things in common with my male protagonist, Ben, you know, we're both Chicagoans. He's around, he's a little younger than me, but you know, we're both kind of middle age and a lot of things in common. So I have gotten that question about Ben and my kind of go-to answer, which is true is I think if Ben were real, we would be friends. Mm, you know, that's a good one. Him, I can imagine him as a friend of mine and we have some similar interests like most friends of mine and I, um, but you know, he's not me. I mean, there's, there, there's some elements of, you know, my first marriage, the ending of my first marriage and things like that, that are loosely lifted from real life, but only in a very loose way, an yeah. unimportant way, I would say. Right. Uh, it's not, it wasn't therapy. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Those are usually all your unpublished novels are, are, are your therapeutic novels therapeutic. because you had to, you had to get shit out of the way. And, and, and you do see that a lot. I mean, you know, with aspiring writers, you read their work and, and I've seen this, especially if somebody's trying to like tackle a memoir, um, a memoir is therapy. Uh, it's, for for the most part, and you're and you're reading it, and, and the, the memoir is a very hard thing to critique because talk about personal, right. you know. But on no, the other hand, with you. <laughs> right? And and on the other hand, you're like, you know, you have to, you have to, you do have to think about the market. You do have to think about getting an agent or or landing a deal. And so, yes, you went through potentially this trauma. But do people want to read about it? And that's a very hard thing to ask somebody who's writing something that, and, you know, is this book for you or is it for the world? Um, and some, and even if it's fiction, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of are just <laughs> exploring their demons through their fiction writing. And it's a, it's a fine line. You have to figure out like how much of this is, is for the market, because at the end of the day, people want to read a compelling story. Um, right. And it doesn't have to be light, doesn't have to be easy, but it has to be compelling. And is this compelling or is this you journaling? Right. <laughs> you know, right. I don't, you know, I don't read much memoir. That's probably why, but um, I agree. I think fiction is, I could never write a memoir. I just, I think there's a fundamental like, uh, insecurity there of thinking like who would care right a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah i got nothing you know i don't have anything worth i mean i i had no like dramatic escape from captivity or anything right right oh, right i just don't, i don't have that interesting of a story to tell you know i sit at my desk i type 
you know, I, I mean, I had a whole career in business, you know, what could be more boring than a career in business? I mean, there's nothing like, I just haven't had that interesting of a life. So I think, I mean, to me, interesting personally, but to be dramatic enough to warrant a book about it. No. Right. I, I, I agree a hundred percent. And, you know, so the question I get, because my stuff tends to be on the darker side is like, well, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. And again, there's this, just this like a dearth of respect for imagination. It's just like, I made this shit up because I thought, what if every page I'm thinking, what if this happens or what if this happened and how can I stretch believability, but still make it, you know, accessible enough that people are like, yeah, that could happen. I can see that could happen. That's, a, that's exciting for me because it's our ability as writers to explore things that we might not want to deal with where they <laughs> to happen in real life. You know, that what would I do in this situation is, the most common thing I'm asking myself because um, and and thinking like, thank God I'm not in this situation. <laughs> right. Exactly. Let's get that figured out on a, in a safe space. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, that's right. and I mean, I think people also forget and writers and MFA programs, I think forget the fun, the entertainment value, or they downplay it, you know, I had a, um, I have a friend, a writer friend, who is a recent MFA, who read uh, part of Sonata and Wax when I was still writing it, and he started his critique. This was sort of a group critique thing. He started his critique by saying, "Well, I'm just not sure why this book needs to be written." <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> that like, should be the blurb oh, on the cover. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, but, the more I reflected on that, the more I thought, first of all, that sounds like something that probably people are tortured with as MFA students. Right. And I, I was never one. I never did an MFA. Nor I. It, it sounds like the kind of like nasty thing that would come up in a critique session you know, in an <laughs> MFA right. program. Some, right. Some revered, socially maladept, slightly passive aggressive writer, professor saying this to some poor vulnerable mfa student like i don't know why this book has to be written <laughs> right but, but the other part was sort of playing it back in my mind i thought well the reason the book has to be written is because it'll entertain people right because i think it's a good story right it's problem? escapism like no yeah, i mean but escapism but i hope with some something more than that you know right some but, some lingering relationship and post read something to you know, make you think about your life and think about moral choices and so forth, perhaps, but fundamentally a good story. A yeah. Good I, I don't it, forget that. And I'm like, you know, that's really, literary fiction writers for sure. Like writers of thrillers, writers of police procedurals, crime novels, all that stuff. You have to be tuned into that. It has to move. It has to entertain. You can't right. leave your reader. Literary fiction novelists, you know, it's much more squishy. But I feel like it needs to be very strongly plotted. I've always struggled, you know, to make sure that my books have good pacing and good reveals and are, you know, right. a good read. Just a good read. Put it that right. Way. Right. And sometimes it's not until you do sell it and you do start getting editorial feedback that that you change it a lot based on, you know, this, this expertise that, that, you know, or this insight that we don't have because we're so close to it. And then you have somebody saying like, you know, I, I need more of this relationship or whatever it is. And I feel like my goal is ultimately to tell a good story and to make, hopefully make the reader feel not necessarily the emotion that my character's feeling, but maybe the emotion that I felt as I was writing it. So if I'm writing a tense scene and I can feel it, I can feel, you know, the breath of the man in my face who had tuna for lunch and he's about to kill me. Mm -hmm. I want them to feel that because I'm freaking out. And, and if I'm not getting those emotions when I'm writing it, then I know like there's something flat here. There's something that's not, that's not working. And I feel like it's structurally, it's fine, but emotionally, it's lacking. And that's what I always go back and look at. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, so I have, I have a question for you about that. When you're writing a scene that has sort of a, uh, 
a, you know, a tension release kind of pattern to it where there's, you know, maybe somebody's about to be murdered or they're confronting the, the villain for the first time, you know? I mean, do you pay attention? Do you tune into your own physiological responses to, to kind of tell you whether it's working like your heart rate rises, you, or if you're writing an erotic scene, you know, do you have certain responses? <laughs> in yeah. That right. I mean, do, I, I, yeah, I think what I feel, and that's a great question because this happened just yesterday. So I sit down and I think we've had this conversation, you know, an hour a day is my writing routine. And if I'm actively writing, especially a first draft, 500 words. So, and that might take 20 minutes and I could be done. Yesterday I was writing this scene and I looked up and I quickly looked at the word count and it was a thousand words and I hadn't even stopped. So that's my, like, I know I'm into it when it's just like, I almost can't write fast enough because I just see it all. I see it all happening. And it is usually those scenes of great tension. Um, and that's how I respond. It's like, I, I lose time a little bit as opposed to like in 10 minutes, like, oh, I wonder if anyone texted me. Let me check my phone or, you know, what, what am I going to make for dinner tonight? And then I'll yeah. go back into it. It's slack. But, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. What about you? Yeah. No, um, same. I mean, I'm not as disciplined and like specifically structured as you are in terms of output and stuff. Um, I kind of write until I start writing too wordily. Like my, <laughs> my no, really, uh -huh, I mean, uh -huh. my indicator that I'm getting uh, tired for that day's session is I'm writing really long sentences. <laughs> so you're too tired to hit the period key <laughs> yeah i mean just i'm losing my you know like the horn player would say losing my lip <laughs> yeah well i think that's smart to be self-aware about the time it takes to start hitting those diminishing returns and and for me that is if i write straight for an hour and i have a 1500 word output say in that hour I know that's about the limit before I, you know, and I could do it again eight hours later, but at that moment, I know it's going to start getting real muddy. Yeah. Um, and that's so cool. then I, that's one of the reasons I stop. It's like, I, and also I, you know, I stop when it starts to feel like work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, cause yeah. it, cause it's hard enough to do anyway. And, and when it really feels like you're just doing data entry, you're like, all right, I, this is not, I, I still have to get my daily minimum, um, but I, there's days where I'm like, I'm not pushing my luck because it was a struggle to even just to get this. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I mean, is your thing like 500 words, seven days a week? Seven days a week. Yeah. Okay. Every single day. So, I mean, my loose goal is a book a year. So my, within that goal is eight months of writing a book, a first draft. Um, and then revisions, sending it to the agent, getting those revisions. But usually within that year is also stop everything. I've got to now make edits on something else that's coming out. And that could be three weeks to three months, depending on how brutal the editorial letter is. Um, so all of that told, you know, my output is like a book to, to shop once a year. Um, mm -hmm. And no one puts that pressure on me except for me. But it, I need that to, in order to have that kind of structure i admire it i mean like i said i'm in I'm an eight-year cicada cycle myself so <laughs> apparently with two data points but um yeah and i i mean that uh, i thought of two people when you were talking one is stephen king mm -hmm. who writes 365 days a year with screaming heavy metal music on uh it's crazy so i've heard um and the other is graham green mm -hmm. who had a routine uh, a very strict routine. I can't remember the exact number, but it was like every day he wrote, you know, 375 words. Yeah. Well, yep. And then had a gin and tonic. Yep. And, you know, I mean, it, I definitely will mid paragraph, I will stop and I might right. make a quick one sentence note to myself of like, maybe this is what happens next, but then you're excited to sit down the next day because you've got the built in momentum. Exactly. And that was, you know, that's Hemingway's advice too was, Oh, always leave something for the next day i forget right. exactly how he said it but the idea was never never finish finish you know at the end of the day always leave yourself 
a hook to hang on so you can move forward. Yeah, yeah. Well, Edward, we're going to wrap up. We've actually gone pretty long because it's, and it's flown by. But before we go, we're going to come to uh, the storytelling part of the show. Um, and so normally what happens is I pick a, pick a book at random from my bookshelves, or I pick three books and you choose one of them. Um, and we pick a random page, a random sentence. I read that sentence. That's the first sentence and maybe a two or three minute long short story. So I read that sentence. You give me the next maybe sentence or two of what might happen. I'll do a sentence or two. And when it goes completely off the rails, we'll stop it. But um, I, I've only done this a couple of times, this, what I'm about to do. And, um, but I don't know why the mood hit me, but it hit me. But we are, we are choosing your novel today. Uh. <laughs> so... All right, Sonata All right, and Wax <laughs> by Edward Hamlin. And of course it can go wherever it's going to go. Obviously it's not going to go along the actual storyline. Um, so okay, give so me a page. I sold at least two copies. <laughs> <laughs> there, exactly. <laughs> give, me, give me a page between one and 400. All right, let's pick uh, page 105. Oh, are, you, are you playing along? Well, um, no, you know, you're setting the rules here, so... So I'm just going to look and I am just going to choose a sentence and I'm going to read that sentence and then yep. you can take it away. Um, my job is, is, is what to, so I'm going to read the sentence and then you do whatever you want with it. So you say like what the next sentence or two, were you writing the story might be, and it can be whatever okay. we, and so it's improv. So we play off of each other. Though I did write the story. So that's, you, <laughs> I know a wrinkle. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to find something short because that usually makes it. Um... <laughs> All right. So the last sentence of the page. His real talent, it turned out, lay on the other side of the glass. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, he was always interested in what snakes did during the daytime and observed them through the glass walls of the aquarium for hours at a time period he was also very aware these were no ordinary snakes in fact this species had only been viewed by three people in the world mm -hmm. he had no idea what might happen were they to get a single fang into his flesh mm -hmm. which raised the obvious question uh, that had been famous among paleontologists the world over. How did those early Neanderthals die in the deep cave in the rocky, porous limestone of France? It appeared that perhaps this very snake might have been the cause. The rumors abounded, of course. Not only the rumors about the Neanderthals' fate due to these snakes, but the possibility that it was these snakes, in fact, that caused some of those Neanderthals to become even superhuman at the time. Mm -hmm. Amazingly, they were able to live complete lives in total darkness within their caves. No one understands how they even could communicate enough to find mates and to perpetuate the Neanderthal line until... It was discovered that these snakes, when handled in a very particular way, could be bioluminescent. And perhaps these highly poisonous bioluminescent snakes provided the Neanderthals a way out to the surface. It's so easy to have your mind filled with theory and conjecture but there was only one way to prove any kind of scientific theorem. He removed the heavy rubber glove on his right hand and lifted the glass. Mm -hmm. At great risk, he took up one of the snake behind the jaw <laughs> because he knew as a herpetologist that that's the only way to be sure that the fangs would not be anywhere near the flesh. However, as a concert pianist, <laughs> he had extremely sensitive fingertips 
And by prodding and holding the snake, he realized that his fingertips were resting exactly on the venom glands, causing venom to be ejected from the snake's fangs directly into his own mouth. Oh, I think we call it there. That was great. You're good at this. <laughs> it's funny. I get, I get a lot of people, some very, very famous writers who are freaked the fuck out by this exercise. <laughs> and you never know what's going to happen. You never know how smooth it's going to be or if we go in totally separate directions. But I will say out of 157 episodes, the word herpetologist has never been uttered during the storytelling. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think you brought up snakes, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that was that was great. That was fantastic. Um, well, Edward, it was good catching up with you. I felt like just kind of sitting down with an old friend and yeah. just, uh, you know, talking about the business a little bit. And, you know, it's funny that a lot of times we go through the writer's history, you know, when did you write your first book? How hard was it? But sometimes we just start talking shop and, and that's a very, uh, that's a very fun uh, episode when that happens for me. Yeah, me too. I really appreciated it. So, and I'm sure we'll uh, connect soon and uh, enjoy the rest of your uh, Boulder sunshine day. We'll have to uh, meet for a beer and continue our short story. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Talk to you soon. Right, take care. Bye. Bye. So that's it. That is my conversation with Edward Hamlin. Uh, I told you he kicked ass at the storytelling. That was really impressive. Um, a little intimidating. He uh, he knocked it out of the park. Uh, his book, Sonata in Wax, was just released this year. I highly, highly encourage you to go read about Edward and read about his book. And you can do all of those things at edwardhamlin.com. And go ahead and check out my website, carterwilson.com. If you want to sign up for my newsletter, buy my books, check out my appearances or read my blog. Uh, um, and then hop on over to unboundwriter.com if you're an aspiring writer, uh, established writer looking for some motivation. Um, and you can check out my retreats, my one-on-one -on -one coaching, and my online self-guided writing courses. All right, friends, that is it. That is it for this episode of Making It Up. It was a good one. There will be another one out just next week. As always, I really appreciate you watching in or listening to the show. And until we meet again, take care.